I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the case Heckler v. Cheney, a 1985 U.S. Supreme Court case about judicial review of agency inaction. And so when we're talking about here, this, this case is in a lot of administrative law case books, and it's usually in the section about the availability of judicial review. And so here we're not talking about the preclusion of review, we're talking about whether you can review, a court can review when an agency hasn't done anything. So we spend a lot of time in administrative law talking about judicial review of agency hearings, of other agency actions, um, and agency interpretations of statutes and, and regulations and so forth. But what happens when somebody's filing a lawsuit because the agency hasn't done anything? And that's what this case is about. It's about inaction. This isn't a criminal law case, even though it's about death row inmates and the death penalty, it, sort of, um, in, uh, and uh, in terms of the facts. I do want my students to connect it with something from their first year criminal law class, which was the distinction that we made in criminal law between um, criminal acts and crimes of omission. And you may remember that the common law courts had to craft some rules to find an actus reus for criminal omissions or crimes of omission. Now, don't get confused. This isn't a criminal law case. We're not talking about crimes of omission, but we are talking about agency inaction or omissions and a challenge to that and whether judicial review is available. So let's look at what happens in Heckler v. Cheney. Um, this starts with a group of death row inmates and who are waiting for execution and which was going to be carried out by lethal injection. And they challenged the lethal injection formula suing the FDA because the FDA hadn't approved this cocktail of drug, any of the drugs in this cocktail to be used to kill people, right? Which is what was happening. In other words, um, when the lethal injection formulas use a combination of a few drugs in high doses that will have the effect of putting the, um, uh, uh, the prisoner into a coma from which they wouldn't recover and then um, also stopping their heart once they're unconscious. So the FDA had never approved the use of these drugs or this combination of drugs for killing um, prison inmates. And uh, so their argument was that the FDA should enforce its regulations about unapproved usage of drugs. And to give a more commonplace example of what this usually means is um, think about the different oxy drugs like OxyContin um, and being prescribed for recreational use, right? Instead of as painkillers. Um, well, the FDA would bring an enforcement action in theory uh, if we were writing prescriptions for using OxyContin um, just to have fun. And so the um, so that would be an unapproved use, and they're saying that um, the using the this these other drugs for lethal injections is an unapproved uh, use, and also they're saying that the drugs the statute says that the FDA has to ensure that drugs are safe and effective. Well, it's not safe and effective if um, you're dead after you take it this combination. So they basically wanted to compel the FDA, the agency, um, to bring an enforcement action to stop the use of the lethal injection drugs. The FDA said it lacked jurisdiction over this and that it, even if it had jurisdiction, it would decline to pursue enforcement in this case. Now, there were really three issues on appeal before the US Supreme Court. First was whether the FDA had jurisdiction to undertake the re requested enforcement. Secondly, whether its refusal to act was subject to judicial review. And third, if there is judicial review, whether the agency decision not to enforce, uh, bring an enforcement action or stop the lethal injection drugs was arbitrary and capricious. Justice Rehnquist writes a majority opinion here and he says for the majority that the court doesn't even have to answer number one and number three on the previous slide um, if they answer number two in the negative. In other words, if there's no judicial review, then we don't have to review whether the FDA has jurisdiction or um, whether their refusal to bring an enforcement action is 
um, uh, arbitrary and capricious. In other words, he says we can just say, we're just going to say no to number two. The refusal to bring an enforcement action is not reviewable. There's no judicial redress for that. He said APA 7061, though, do note that the, the, I think that reasonable minds could have differed about this because it says a reviewing court shall compel agency action unlawfully withheld or unreasonably delayed. So it wasn't crazy that uh, lawyers thought that you could ask for judicial review when an agency was um, withholding action that it looks like under its statute it's supposed to take. But um, Justice Rehnquist for the majority here says, uh, we don't do that. Now the court discusses the Overton Park case in this case and um, how that case distinguished between explicit preclusion statutes and 701A1 and matters that are committed to agency discretion in 701A2. But Overton Park was really about an agency action and this is about agency inaction. Now, um, here's a great quote. Um, he says, the majority notes the uh, general unsuitability for judicial review of agency decisions to refuse enforcement. Um, basically, that he thinks these are just unsuitable for judicial review. And he suggests in this case that categorical refusals to enforce might be review, uh, reviewable, but it's really hard to find examples of that. So if the FDA just decided we're not enforcing any drug laws anymore, um, that type of drastic sweeping categorical decision might be enforceable, but uh, an agency deciding not to go after one um, offender or violator or, or even a list of specific violators is unreviewable. He gives a few reasons for this, and this is an important takeaway from the case. He says agency enforcement decisions require balancing many factors like the agency's budget, right? They, they don't have infinite resources. They can't enforce every, bring, go after every violation. Their priorities, the likelihood of a success, the agencies don't wanna waste a lot of resources litigating something where they don't have good evidence and can't, aren't sure they can win because they don't have enough proof. Um, the urgency of the potential harm and so forth. And agencies are better equipped to make all of these decisions than courts, right? The courts can't assess things like budgets and the priorities, which cases are should be highest priority and which ones can wait till next year. Um, and uh, the likelihood of success when the case isn't, e the evidence isn't even like uh, formally in discovery yet and so forth. And the eight, so that should be left to the agencies. Also, he says, there's no real exercise of the government's coercive power when the agency does nothing. And this is an interesting point, right? He says that uh, if we look at the constitution as sort of checks and balances and the judiciary providing a check to overreaching by the other branches, if the executive branch is not doing anything, then it's less critical that we keep them in check than when they're um, uh, doing something destructive. He also compares this to prosecutorial discretion. And if you've taken criminal procedure, you know that the courts really don't wanna review whether prosecutors, these challenges claiming that prosecutors are acting unlawfully if they decide not to bring charges in a certain case. That's always been, the, the courts have always decided that prosecutors have a lot of discretion um, about which cases they charge and which ones they decide not to bring, again, Prosecute DA's offices, but U.S. attorney's offices don't have infinite resources. They can't charge every crime. And so they kind of have to pick and choose. And they also uh, have to weigh um, uh, how much evidence they have and how strong the evidence it is. And that's kind of good for everyone, right? So they don't harass you when they have a flimsy case. They don't waste the court's time if they have a flimsy case. Uh, they, they can't really prove their case and so forth. And so the courts have always sort of respected the discretion of, the, of prosecutors to decide when to hold off on prosecuting a certain um, a violator or certain suspect. And and there's something analogous, even though this is not a criminal case, but it's, there's something analogous to agency enforcement. 
we do have a concurrence here. The concurrence agrees, I'm just gonna tell you what you need to know about it, with the result in this case, but disagrees with the presumption of unreviewability for agency decisions not to enforce. In other words, a concurrence says, um, th this case is really far-fetched, the FDA doesn't have to do anything here, but they don't think we should be making a general rule that the courts will never review agency uh, inaction or a lack of enforcement. And it's, so it says that the court could review where there's a clear abuse of discretion, um, but should show deference otherwise. Where does this leave us? Well, the majority here says that there is also no review of an agency's choice of remedy if they do decide to bring in an enforcement action. So sometimes agencies have a number of options. They can basically um, uh, ask for fines or ask for injunctive re relief or um, re seek revocation of a license or permit or things like that. And um, so not only are we not going to review their decisions to, um, to hold off on enforcement, but if they do bring an enforcement action, we're not going to review the agency's choice of what remedy they're asking for, unless it's patently arbitrary and capricious. So this suggests that normal levels of arbitrariness and capriciousness would be immune to judicial scrutiny, at least when it comes to the agency's choice of remedy. Also, a, a few other parting thoughts or points about this case. Note that a party having alternative remedies available like habeas corpus relief and Cheney may warrant against judicial review, but the opposite is not true. A lack of other alternatives does not guarantee review. Just to be clear, these death row inmates have other appeals, right, that they can bring. Um, and so a court may decide we don't have to review, this is kind of, of all the ways to try to get out of the death penalty or avoid being executed, um, trying to get the FDA to ban the lethal injection drug seemed like a stretch. And um, on the other hand, if a party comes and says, um, look, there's no other way to address my problem, that doesn't necessarily mean the court is going to say, okay, fine, well, then we will bring in enforcement, we'll, we'll allow judicial review of a lack of enforcement. Also note that even if a court does review agency decisions not to enforce, the agency is still going to win on the merits most of the time. Okay, here's a review question to see if you've been paying attention. What's the main holding of Heckler v. Cheney regarding judicial review of agency decisions? Courts A, courts normally will not review agency inaction in the form of not enforcing a statute or a regulation, or B, courts will normally apply hard look review to agency decisions not to enforce a statute. Hopefully you were paying attention. If you got distracted and can't answer this question, you really should rewatch the video because that concludes our lecture about Heckler v. Cheney.